Okay, I think we'll give two minutes of grace and then we'll get started. I guess we can go ahead and get started here since we have quite a bit to cover and we want to hear fully from all of our fantastic panelists today. So, bonjour, bienvenido, bienvenue, and welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Samantha Pickering and I'm the Director of Education at Plastic Oceans International and I'm based in Detroit, Michigan in the United States. We'd like to begin today by acknowledging that from wherever you are at today, we are all sitting on indigenous land within our respective communities. And Plastic Oceans works to support the land and its intrinsic value within our four pillars, which are education, advocacy, action, and science. Our programs are centered around fostering sustainable communities across the globe through local impacts. So we are here today in honor of our Trees and Seas Festival, where ocean meets land conservation. Since the earth is composed of an infinite number of ecosystems that are all interconnected, humans are also directly connected to the earth as well, not separate from it. And that's one of the main reasons why environmental education is essential for everyone to experience. We can't protect the oceans without protecting the land and vice versa. Environmental education is a pretty fast growing field these days, and it's also a pretty essential one. It's an interdisciplinary education medium with cultural relevance and an essential component for sustainable development goal number four, quality education. From the integration of technology and environmental education to potential policies that would make it more equitable and accessible for students globally. Today, we'll investigate some of these holistic practices and also gain some insight on the future and what the vision is for environmental education moving forward to help support a culture of sustainability across the globe. We're very grateful to have such a wonderful panel for you today to discuss all of their work in environmental education. So just really quick before we get into everybody's introductions. If you happen to have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A section within the Zoom. And from there, we will have some time towards the end of the panel for some additional questions for our panelists today. Okay, so without further ado, we'll roll through one of our first panelists. So Ian Shanahan is with Green Teacher. He's the editor-in-chief. And Ian's combined passions of nature, education, art, writing, editing, and storytelling have led him to Green Teacher, where he became the general editor in 2018. Uh, this role has gradually expanded to include webinar hosting, podcast co-hosting, and also facilitating professional development sessions on climate change and biodiversity education. Uh, across 13 seasons with Ontario Parks, Ian worked as a naturalist at the Press Keel for eight years a species at risk surveyor at Charleston Lake for one year and a naturalist at Algonquin for four years. The last of which was spent backfilling as the coordinator of Algonquin's renowned interpretive program. Concurrently, he completed his BAH at Queens University 
and then his BED at the University of Toronto before becoming an Ontario certified teacher. Off the corner of his desk, Ian works as a voice actor, nature artist, writer, environmental consultant, and nature guide. Thanks so much for being here with us today, Ian. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. And our next panelist, uh, may not be able to make it here with us this morning, but just so you're all aware of him, I'll give his brief introduction. Corbin Jacobs is a coordinator and leader for the Bakajwanan Eco Keepers and comes from the Walpole Island First Nation and his clan is Deer. Corbin's goal is to inspire Indigenous people to live a healthy and balanced life. And when he isn't working, he enjoys working out, swimming, playing lacrosse, and socializing. So hopefully we'll be able to hear from Corbett and some of his programming today. Great. And next we have Mimi Trainer, who is the Chief Learning and Inspiration Officer with Notion. For the past 27 years, Mimi has devoted her life to creating innovative and efficient learning environments for K-9 through students. From co-founding the prestigious private school, Varmund, to spearheading a learning revolution in Latin America, she brings global vision, love of education, strong connection to the environment, and a keen interpersonal awareness to every project. Mimi managed the development of more than 1,700 engaging multi-touch books, which set the foundation for her current endeavor, which is to redefine learning environments for students while they become conscious and impactful global citizens. In 2014, together with an amazing interdisciplinary team, she co-founded Notion, which is a leading, a leading and innovative ed tech company, which serves more than 250 schools, more than 10,000 teachers, and 60,000 learners in four countries in order to change their way of thinking, learning, and behaving for a better humanity. Good morning, Mimi. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning Pre to all. Appreciate it. And last but not least this morning, we have Danica Strecko from Project Learning Tree. She is their senior education manager. Danica plays a central role in expanding SFI's educational work in Canada. She helps lead the overall development of educational materials and programs and is helping to launch and implement the Project Learning Tree Forest Literacy Framework, which translates the complex language of forest and sustainable forest management into accessible concepts for grades K through 12. Danica's wealth of education experience includes everything from working in the classroom to implementing online learning programs and providing strategic leadership in the education community. Prior to joining SFI, she was the manager of online learning and ocean literacy for the not-for-profit OceanWise and a board member of the Marine Life Sanctuary Society. Danica is a BC Ministry of Education certified teacher and also holds a Bachelor of Education from the University of British Columbia. And she is currently working towards a Master of Educational Technology from UBC. And a quick side note, Danica has been pretty essential to some of our uh, educational materials for this Trees and Seas Festival. So Plastic Oceans has been providing some of the uh, ocean conservation educational materials. And Danica has gratefully shared with us a lot of the Project Learning Tree forest literacy materials as well. So we can combine both of those for teachers and folks around the world to use. Thank you so much for being here, Danica. Thanks so much. It's wonderful to be here. All right. So now we're going to roll into our questions. So each panelist will answer the questions. And then we do have some individual questions for each organization that will break things up in the middle. So we will start with our first question, which is, can you tell us a little bit about your organization and how you implement environmental education? And we'll start with Ian for this one. Great, thanks so much. So uh, representing Green Teacher, we've been around since 1986 when Green Teacher actually started in Wales in the UK. And Green Teacher moved to North America in 1991 and began as uh, a paperback magazine. And we still have a, a magazine, but it has graduated to being fully digital. And the magazine offers insights, activities, articles, and lesson plans for all age groups within K to 12 about environmental education and of course all the topics within that. We've moved more to a resource portal 
uh, structure. So we kind of liken it as a Netflix for environmental education. So all of our archived materials are organized by topic and age group in the subscriber-based resource portal. So the magazine is still our major avenue of operations, but we do have four additional avenues. So the other is a series of books. So we've published 10 books to date. Our two most recent are Teaching Kids About Climate Change and Teaching Teens About Climate Change. And those similarly to the magazine offer insights, articles, activities, and lesson plans about climate change education for K to 12. We've been doing webinars for over a decade now. Um, in fact, my predecessor, Tim Grant, started webinars essentially before everyone else was doing webinars. So it was kind of ahead of the curve in that respect. And then our two most recent channels of operation, our podcast, Talking with Green Teachers, launched in the summer of 2020 and has been heard by folks in over 80 countries and all six continents, Antarctica accepted. I guess penguins aren't interested in podcasts just yet. And we also do professional development for K to 12 schools across North America. So those are our five channels of operations. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I love everything that you all do. It's such a unique approach to this type of work. And, you know, hopefully soon those penguins, they'll, they'll learn how to read and they'll be interested in what you all have to share as well. We'll keep working on them. <laughs> Okay, and we'll turn it over to Mimi. Uh, well, at Notion, uh, we create and generate student-centered learning ecosystems for K-12 schools. So we, what we do is we empower all of the stakeholders, all of the learning audience, and what we really want to do is to raise the classroom walls and turn the world into a potential classroom. Uh, together with the team, we created a challenge-based and human design center curriculum, which really integrates all of the academic standards with life competencies development. So all of it, concepts, skills, attitudes, with a real life contextual framework that is aligned to the sustainable development goals. So when our students are allowed to solve real life challenges and to tackle humanity's global issues and put into action all of the knowledge that they have acquired, it not only erases their level of awareness as global citizens, but it really gives them the confidence that they can actually impact and make a difference for themselves, for the communities, and of course, for the planet. So I'm really pleased to participate in this panel because one of our main goals is to make sure that from a very young age, they grow as sustainable beings, not only with environmental consciousness, but also with regenerative awareness. And uh, what we, we try to help them so that they can create solutions that not only stop the damage that we are creating to the planet, but can actually think of new solutions to regenerate the ecosystems and especially uh, based on the local inquiry that they are creating. Thank you so much. I think it's it's so wonderful to pair something that kids, you know, are now growing up with, with technology, and they all have iPads and using that, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. So we'll take this type of education, put it on that platform, because that'll keep them interested. And like you're saying, like, that's going to help build that foundation for them to translate those skills in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you. Great. And now we'll shift over to Danica. Thanks. Um, so Project Learning Tree, or PLT, uses trees and forests as windows onto the world to increase students' understanding of the environment and actions that they can take to conserve it. Since, um, or in 2020 alone, PLT has reached about 2.3 million students and trained nearly 8,000 educators to help students learn how to think, not what to think, about complex environmental issues. PLT provides educators with peer-reviewed, award-winning curriculum materials to engage students in learning about the environment. And we train educators and show how kind of easy and accessible it is to bring environmental education into everyday lesson plans using our hands-on and multidisciplinary activities. We have three kind of equally important components that characterize the PLT programming which is high quality instructional materials for grades pre-K to 12, 
carefully designed professional development, and an extensive distribution and support network. That network is so crucial to how PLT works in the environmental education space. With our network spanning across the US and internationally, it provides hands-on professional development to help classroom and non-formal educators so they can confidently teach outside in a really place-based context. And it goes beyond that, you know, really providing support in those local communities. So I always really encourage folks to contact our PLT state coordinators for local resources and assistance and ideas incorporating nature into classrooms and programming um, and really kind of connecting to that network of professionals um, for that support. Thank you so much, Danica. I know I loved looking through all of your resources and just how detailed they were and connected back to a lot of the learning standards in different locations, respectively. And it just makes it so much easier for teachers to go online and get the resource, learn the lesson, and be able to implement it right in their classroom. So, you know, you don't have to schedule the field trip and try and get everybody out to go somewhere. It just makes it that much more accessible. Thank you so much. And Shifting into our organization specific questions, we're actually going to start with you, Danica. So with your work at Project Learning Tree and all of your experience and expertise, why is it so essential for students to be exposed to this type of education? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really kind of love being able to speak to this. And I really feel that environmental education um, connects us to the the world that's around us and kind of really makes us part of it. So teaching about natural and built environments, environmental education offers opportunities for experiential learning outside of the classroom um, and enables students to make connections to apply their learning in the real world. It helps learners to see the interconnectedness of ecological, social, economic, cultural, and political issues. And I really kind of love that kind of back and forth between bringing nature into the classroom and taking students outside to learn and being really open to those kind of impromptu teachable moments with families, young people. You can learn different skills needed to make informed choices about the environment and complex environmental issues like climate change and energy. So kind of once you start that environmental education exploration, it just leads to so many other um, important pieces and discussions that I think we want to be having as a community of practice and with our learners. Very much so. Yeah, it's more about, you know, getting them out there and helping them connect and just building those inherent values that they'll carry with them for the rest of their lives. So thank you. Much appreciated. Okay, and our next question is going to go to green teacher Javier, since um, Corbin still hasn't joined us here. So Ian, this is for you. So again, from your area of expertise and everything that you've gained from doing this type of work, how does environmental education vary across the variety of countries green teachers providing research is for? Yeah, this is certainly a really important question because we recognize that not everybody is at the same place and we can even look at comparisons between different parts of Canada in terms of the integration of the knowledge of various Indigenous communities and I, I always preface this by saying that we try to stay away from a pan-Indigenous labeling because that does a disservice to the many indigenous communities and i mean there's the great diversity among indigenous communities all across the world but bringing in the perspectives of the indigenous communities in different areas we're seeing so much momentum with that in different parts of canada particularly in british columbia we're starting to see that in different parts of the united states but there are other parts of Canada, other parts of the US, other parts of the world that aren't as far along in that aspect of the journey. So that is certainly something that we try to look at what gaps are out there and how we can help fill those gaps to meet people where they're at and try to essentially flatten the access. And one of our routes for doing that is through the podcast. I mean, our, our magazine and our books 
our fee base, which is our primary fund, uh, funding source, but the podcast is completely open source. It's available on all of the regular podcast platforms to anybody who has internet access. And that's a way of accessing people and bringing these different perspectives, including the various indigenous perspectives. And we also recognize with topics like climate change and energy, different parts of the world are, are in very different places. It's become very politicized in Western countries. It's less politicized in a lot of developing countries, particularly in the global South, where they're living through the impact, impacts of climate change on a much more regular basis in many cases. So it's recognizing that the language we use, if we're talking about politicization of the climate issue, that isn't particularly relevant in a lot of parts of the world where they're like, forget the politics, we need to cut emissions now. Why are we dilly dallying about who said what and right versus left when we just need to cut emissions? So it's really looking at where people are and trying to meet them where they're at. That's all fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. I know it's, it's extremely difficult to, you know, make things streamlined and universal for folks across the globe. That's just something that's not really possible. And you all at Green Teacher do an amazing job of meeting folks where they're at and getting them the resources that they need. Thank you so much. Okay, and our last uh, organizational question is for Mimi at Notion. Are there any new innovative technology practices that are being developed that could help expand these educational practices? Well, absolutely. As you know, we are a digital solution and our aim obviously is to create digital citizenship amongst our students. And our team uh, develops augmented reality, virtual reality, interactivity, in order to be able to engage and motivate all of our learners. But something that is very important is that all of the framework that we've created triggers the action. So we don't have the students within the iPad all the time or, or the tablet. What happens is that that's what prompts them to actually be outside. And as Anika was saying, just to explore and to be in contact with nature, and uh, this really gives them this uh, sense of participating and creating. That's one of the most important things that technology does, that it allows the students to actually create. And since the framework is always uh, giving them challenges to solve, they are creating new solutions. And one of our greatest strengths is having amazing partnerships. And these allow us to use technology to create deeper awareness and understanding. So right now, for example, we're working with WeDo. And this is an amazing platform which measures the environmental footprint and also aids the whole community to take action according to the results so that everyone can mitigate or reduce the negative impact on the environment. Because with technology, something that you can do is gain reach. And you can reach not only the students or the learners, but their families, and you can involve the whole community, and they can all be part of it. This generates account for us, it generates accountability, but it also raises awareness significantly. And since it's done with gamification, uh, all of the users receive awards, for example, from the NGOs or from green companies. So it makes it social, it creates community, but above all, a real engagement and it fosters a sustainable lifestyle. So we do, we do use technology in favor of learning and also in favor of creating this environmental awareness for a whole community. Thank you. Yeah, you know, listening to you all now talking about the discovery and exploration piece, it just reminds me of uh, my advisor and professor in my undergrad. And one day he said, you know, you could go out into nature and point out an oak tree, point out a sycamore. He said, but once you identify something, the learning stops. So he always encouraged getting out and exploring and asking as many questions about the tree or the plant as possible before doing any identification. Because once you know what something is, you kind of just stop thinking about it so much because you're like, okay, I know what that is. But yeah, it's all about exploring and just seeing what you're curious in and making those 
you know, discoveries and explorations on your own. So thank you very much, Mimi. Great. So our last question for you all today is centered around policy. So here in the States, we have uh, a Senate bill that's no child left inside, and it's the act for 2022. And it was on the table previously several years ago, went away, and now it's come back. And it's aimed towards promoting environmental literacy and to make sure every student should have the opportunity to participate in residential outdoor education programs or any type of comparable outdoor education or indoor education learning programs. So this would essentially, if this passes, this would essentially provide some more funding for environmental education as a whole, and also sort of work with uh, school boards to help them implement environmental education within the curriculums within all of those schools. And I'm curious for you all, since we're all sort of in different areas, um, if you've had any time where you've pondered this, like what type of policy would better support your efforts? And yeah, like, do you have anything on the table currently like we do here? And for this, we'll start with Danica. Awesome. I mean, I think, again, you really kind of already spoke to the, the policy that really connects to our, our main focus, which is that we really hope to see environmental education integrated into curriculum and how kind of young people are learning those problem solving skills that they need to make informed decisions about the environment and increasingly complex environmental issues. So, you know, really, again, looking to the school boards and how we can work with them to address that environmental literacy piece, whether it is through, you know, forest literacy efforts, it's having that support for educators that it's in the curriculum and that both educators and students are kind of working towards that, that we really see that that will, you know, make it so much more successful to have that increased um, environmental connection and education piece. Thank you so much. Yeah, it is a, it's very critical to have. And we'll turn this question over to Mimi now. Thank you. No, I totally agree. And I think definitely that it needs to be part of the curriculum, but I would add one element that it wouldn't be fragmented or isolated from everything else. Because as you know, um, everything is intertwined and language is connected with ecology and the science and the history and every, everything that the kids are learning. So uh, one of the things that I would love to see in every curriculum throughout the world, it's transdisciplinarity because that creates a higher context and, me and it creates meaning to everything the students are learning. And another thing would be to really be able to create immersion in the development of all of these life competencies and all of it being part of the curricular model would create a deep connection with the inner development of each kid or each learner, but uh, a place where Cognitive results would not be the most important part, but they would be just paired with a higher level of consciousness and evidently including environmental responsibility and, unit, and unity. So I truly believe that uh, children in every community deserve the opportunity to create for themselves a healthy, a prosperous, a peaceful and sustainable life. And for it to happen, we really need to understand that uh, the role the kids have right now, and just as Ian mentioned, sometimes we're in the middle of everything and we're not aware of it. So if we work with them and uh, really help them understand their role, their active role now, you know, and how it is going to affect their future, then it would definitely benefit them. And we would uh, be raising this amazing generation that is accountable, competent, conscious, and responsible. So, so yes, definitely to, to have it in. Thank you. Yeah, it is very essential to, like you said, that's my favorite word these days is transdisciplinary because that is key to being able to solve a lot of the solutions within climate change issues as well and our human impact. It's 
you know, you have all these complex issues and then to solve those, you need, you know, a complex base to work off of. It can't be just within one discipline. Thank you so much. And now we'll pass it over to Ian. I, I was nodding along with both Nimi and Danica. I mean, I certainly agree with everything that they said. Uh, curriculum it has to start there. I look to a state like New Jersey where they've implemented climate change education from K to 12 in all areas, which is a massive breakthrough. It's revelatory. It's miraculous. It's, it's so many superlatives I could use to describe it. And, you know, this is a living, breathing model that we can exemplify. And I think that's certainly somewhere we, we want to look. I think also it, it's looking critically at the various digital technologies that we have. And in no way would I ever want to suggest that it's a, an either or situation. It's not a false dichotomy of having to choose outdoor and environmental education over digital technologies, because digital technologies absolutely have a, a very important place to play in all education, including environmental education. But I, I do worry that we've been very quick to adopt a lot of digital technologies into the classroom without thinking as critically as we perhaps should about the impacts that they're having on our ability to socialize. And I'm certainly not saying we should take any digital technologies out of the classroom, but I think being more just conscious of how we're using it and when, I mean, we do know that just in the reality of a typical classroom, in free time, students go on their phones and they're not using it for educational purposes. And that takes away these great opportunities for socializing and coming up with ideas and maybe having the phones as tools that I, I, I liken them to graphing calculators. In math class, teacher would say, okay, we're going to use the graphing calculators now. And she pull out a bin and out came the graphing calculators when we'd use them and it was great, but then they went away and, and we moved on to something else. Maybe that's how iPads and tablets and cell phones, including personal cell, cell phones could be used is they have their time, but then they, they go away so that it allows time for those social moments and those beautiful moments where ideas come from seemingly nowhere. So I think the technology has changed so fast, it's very difficult to keep up from a regulatory perspective. And I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that, but I, I think we're seeing a lot of the downfalls of it and we want to maybe eliminate the downfalls while keeping the benefits. And I think there are regulations that can be put in place to certainly make that happen. And I don't think it would be particularly costly either. It's a really interesting point. And I really, appreciate how you brought up the it's not this or that we need to keep that attitude of this and because we need all of these uh, sure. moving pieces finding that synchronicity and moving together and yeah digital detox is never a bad thing sometimes you know just give your brain a quick break from that so thank you so much Ian okay so now we're going to check in and see if there were any questions in the Q&A if you could, if you see anything, Javier. No questions. No questions? All right. Well, I had a couple back up. If you all don't mind kind of just having a discussion, I'll just throw a couple of these questions out there and you guys can go ahead and jump in as you feel, okay? So one thing I think about here is um, in Detroit, we have a plethora of grassroots organizations centered around environmentalism, but we do have so many that are just focused on environmental education, or it's at least like one of the core components of the organization. And I've been trying to think lately about how we could all kind of be a little bit more aware of each other and know what each other's resources are and our strengths. So that way, when we're out and about, we can also help spread the word about each other um, to try and also kind of eliminate some competition, because that's something that I've unfortunately noticed, at least here over the past years that I've been in this field. So I'm curious to see, like, as the field of environmental education grows, how could we build a system so we as organizations could be more aware of each other and have a really solid understanding of what educational materials we have to offer? Okay. 
Yeah, I can certainly offer a model. There's an organization based out of southeastern British Columbia called the Columbia Basin Environmental Education Network, and a branch of theirs is the nonprofit outdoor learning store. And full disclosure, I do some outreach work for them. But even prior to that, they they really made a concerted effort to try to get at least in Canada as many environmental ed organizations as possible in a working partnership and not just a symbolic partnership, but a practical partnership where there are regular meetings where all the partners are invited to participate and amplify each other's voices, know what each other is doing so that we're not replicating, we're not competing. And I think that has had a, a very strong impact and the network is starting to reach out into the United States with some of the state affiliates with the North American Association of Environmental Education. Because I think getting ourselves to talk with one another and not compete with one another is, is an essential step. And as I say, it's starting to happen now in Canada because largely of the efforts of this organization that I mentioned. And I think the next step beyond that is trying to get our resources and our messages to people who are the uninitiated. Because the people who are interested and recognize the value of outdoor and environmental education are going to look until they find us. And that's great. And that's really important. It's how do we get to the folks who aren't initiated, who could be, but haven't yet. And I, I think it's this essential step before we get to connecting with the uninitiated, we need to be connecting better with each other. So having these networks where we actually meet via Zoom, on a regular basis and, and literally talk to each other. I, I found that to be really useful within Canada. And I see that as a model that could be replicated elsewhere. And also I would like to add that something that has really worked for us is since we have, uh, we're working with more than almost 300 schools and they each uh, work with specific organizations or NGOs they're sharing among the network. But the most powerful thing that we've seen is that all of the students, for example, all of the fifth graders in all of the schools are working or focusing on the same challenge that has to do with uh, an environmental topic specifically. So they share their actions and they share what their, uh, the solutions that they've been finding, which are all different because they work from their locality, they do their inquiry in their home um, town, but they create a solution that is global and that can be that can also support other students. And we've seen that the, with the learners, this ripple effect starts because the parents get engaged, the teachers are involved, and then the whole community becomes part of the solution. So I think that using the power of the students, of the kids and the learners is magical because they can they can really help us make a difference. And maybe I'll just kind of add on to, to both what Mimi and Ian has said. And I think, again, really being able to connect to those communities of practice, you know, as we've gotten a little bit more used to connecting through Zoom calls and, and having those opportunities not to just wait for like an in-person opportunity to connect with other organizations. I think it's really wonderful to be able to, to reach out and be part of those groups and learn about what they're doing. And definitely all of those kind of online gathering places is, is such a wonderful way, way to share that work. I know that a big um, point of connection for the work that I do is the North American Association of Environmental Educators EE Pro group and anyone can sign on and create an account and connect to educators and environmental specialists and you know really kind of learn about the research that's going on if they're interested in that so it's again a great opportunity to bring people from all different kind of backgrounds and places of work that want to share the conversation around environmental education and and connecting to those opportunities is a great way to to bring people together and this opportunity with the trees and seas festival is is one of those opportunities too that we get to connect over those common conversation uh, points and you know really recognize that we're all connected and get to work with one another in a, a different capacity than maybe we have before. 
So thank you, Samantha, for bringing us all together as well. Well, thank you all. That's fantastic, you know, and it's it's good to be aware of each other and to you know, we're all in this together, essentially, rather than working separately. There are ways, brilliant ways that you guys all just pointed out for us to sort of, you know, cross those bridges and combine efforts and yeah, just at least be aware of each other. So great. I'm just going to mention really quick in case anybody does have a question that's come up, if you can go ahead and like raise your hand and we can come back around to it. And I just have one more in my little, um, toolbox here, which is sort of big, maybe a little out there, but thinking of a like utopian future for environmental education, what is like one thing you would pick to have to really help build on what you're already doing and to also just, you know, continue to build the field and everything that we've been working towards? I would only say to work closer together, like as I mentioned, one of our strengths is the part the amazing partnerships that we have, like with you, like Plastic Oceans and where world's largest lesson. And I think that being able to echo each other's uh, work and everything that we're doing together, I think that would really, really support the work we're all doing. Because sometimes, you know, it's, you need to work on that. To, to have a louder voice on, on the work we're doing. Maybe I'll, I'll jump in next. And I would say kind of again in that, you know, future perfect world, again, is kind of really building back that connection and kind of inherent value of nature through everyone. And I think it was great kind of hearing from everyone here today that that's all kind of um, a big part of the program when we do that transdisciplinary approach to kind of not isolating environmental education experiences or even that kind of work with and in environmental spaces, but for everyone to grow up as, you know, an environmentally literate community to see those connections on a daily basis and to look towards um, green careers that youth can kind of aspire to and move towards and also you know turning every career potentially into a green and sustainable career and really seeing those future opportunities through that lens I think would be amazing to see as we kind of work with youth of all ages to build that connection so that they see that it is a place that is accessible and inviting to them, you know, reducing those barriers of getting outside and taking that time to enjoy that space. And then also kind of looking to the towards their future careers and how they can make, you know, those ongoing connections possible for them and kind of really see that that future shared work would be amazing to see. And again, jumping on top of that and nodding along in full agreement, in addition to incorporating environmental education across curricula and across learning right from beginning to end, not that there is an end, I should say, that's a misnomer, but the infrastructure of our educational institutions, our school buildings, particularly K to 12, I mean, this is much more long term, we can't just change the structure of schools today, but integrating nature into the buildings so that we don't have these blocky institutionalized often somewhat ugly buildings that are quite literally separate from nature incorporating it having green roofs having green houses having outdoor classrooms and the infrastructure for that with shelters i mean that this is maybe a bit too utopic in thinking but such buildings do exist but of course, there it does take decades to switch over the look of all of our school buildings, but it's not impossible. It just, of course, would take some time. Thank you all so much. And yeah, Ian, I, I agree with that last point, because I've definitely been in classrooms where there aren't even any windows. So you're just kind of like, you know, stuck in that concrete block, sort of like you're at a grocery store or something, and you're just sort of trapped in there. It's not not the greatest for the kids, but um, I love 
everything that you all are doing. I'm very grateful for all of your work. It's definitely essential to, you know, work towards that paradigm shift and that shift of consciousness and doing so with our youth. I mean, they're, they're our future voters. So those are the ones that are going to be replacing us in the near future and, you know, hopefully taking on some new and different green jobs and working on partnerships with each other to amplify all of those efforts because it truly does build a fantastic, some sort of fantastic community that we could all work off of. So it looks like we have one question if you all are up for just one more and it's, are there any modern school systems which better include environmental education? So I think, Ian, you kind of touched on that a little bit, but now I'm seeing this other one, which we'll go with. Uh, what advice could we give to the parents of these children? I know in the US, there are a lot of schools that engage in service learning, which is community based and gets people out into the community as part of their education. And there are courses devoted to that. We're well behind in Canada in terms of doing that. But my advice would be look for schools that allow for those opportunities for community based learning, which is, you know, overlaps very heavily with place based education, which is inherent in environmental education. And obviously I'm gonna say find an ocean school <laughs> because uh, we're, we're strongly working on um, creating this environmental awareness amongst all of our communities. And, uh, but I would say, I mean, trying to be very objective, I would ask parents to really look into the curriculum and see if it's transdisciplinary, if, it's, if it really builds those life competencies, if it really, focuses on creating a higher awareness rather than just the you know standards and uh, getting good grades for tests which is the shift that we need to see amongst amongst schools and i think i can also really you know say that it's it's that community effort is that any school can incorporate environmental education and can start kind of working towards those outdoor classroom spaces or community gardens and and learning opportunities and so i know that you know it parents already have a lot going on but you know just to ask questions and connect to the school that your your children are going to and kind of see where you can have that conversation to kind of help move the needle or support an initiative kind of if it's important to the parents it's going to be important to the the school and it probably already is to some capacity so i think that's always a great move is that you don't um have to worry so much about you know where to place your kids but then bring that opportunity to whatever community you're engaging in i know uh, project learning tree has a program called green schools which is even kind of a little toolkit for some beginner ways to start having that conversation or looking for resources that can come into schools. Um, and so, you know, that can be done at, at any level and in, in any place. And I think that's also really important that it's always going to connect to that local community and that local need if it's done in that kind of place based learning context as well. That's a really good point. Thank you so much. I know like we've discussed a lot of really big changes and shifts throughout this conversation this morning. And I know sometimes, you know, as people are who we are, we tend to, you know, get a little bit overwhelmed when we see that big picture at the end of the game, like reconstructing an entire school and curriculum and things. But it's not an impossible feat. Like these, everything we've discussed today is very very implementable. And it's just one of those things where we, you know, need to hang on to our patience with it and slowly chip away at things. So, you know, we, we can slowly work towards that shift. Um, because sometimes when a lot of big change happens all at once, you know, we, we may tend to go into a little bit of shock about it, like a culture shock. So it's good to kind of ease into things. And, you know, environmental education is fantastic in the sense that it is just truly so easy to integrate into any other type of learning model and, you know, bring it on in. It connects directly to STEM core principles as well as, 
you know, different science standards and things that schools have that they have to adhere to, but you could easily pop it in as you go along. So, well, unless there's any more questions, I think we had a really great conversation this morning and we're very, very, very grateful for all of our panelists today for taking the time to be here with us and, you know, have this, you know, explorative conversation in this process. So I'd like to say thank you to you all. Big, big gratitude to each of you. And if anyone is interested in the other panels we have coming up this week, you can check out the Trees and Seas website for Plastic Oceans. And we have a, a different offering every day. So, and unless we have any last comments from our panelists this morning. Okay, I think that wraps us up. So again, thank you to all our participants for being here and to all of our panelists. And I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.